So here at Crossroads, we love to talk about simply responding to Jesus. It's pretty much who we are as a church. What that means is that Jesus is real and that at every moment of our lives, Jesus is inviting us. There's an invitation that is being extended to all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter how long we've been there, no matter how far we've been from the Lord, no matter how closely we walk with the Lord, Jesus invites each one of us every day. But we live in unique times, don't we? We live in divided times. We live in a day and age where if we take the news's take on it, every single day the world is falling apart. As we, everything just feels like it's coming apart. And because there's so much tension in the world that we live in today, and there's so much struggle, many of us internally feel like that we're coming apart on the inside as well. And many of you know what I'm talking about, where there's this feeling like, is things ever going to click? Is it ever going to really work? But what's amazing is, is that no matter how perilous or divided times may be, there is always an echo of a reality that there is a world that is pressing into this divided world that is inaugurating and bringing in something that is so breathtakingly beautiful that if we were to just tune in our hearts and our ears, we would experience heaven on earth. That's the echoes that I want to talk with you about today, that we're starting in this series today. See, many, many centuries ago, God's people, the children of Israel, were divided. They had, they had great prosperity under the reigns of King David and King Solomon, but they fell upon hard times. The, the, the kingdom, the 12 tribes got divided with these 10 tribes in the north and the two tribes in the south. And in the midst of a divided kingdom, the people of God were divided and they were struggling to find their way. But into a divided kingdom, God raised up a voice. God raised up the voice of a number of prophets who came on in and spoke timeless truths into challenging and changing times right where the children of Israel lived. And those words were like water in the desert. Those words were like the first rays of sunlight after a hundred plus days of rain. And I believe that those are the same type of words that God wants to speak into our lives today into your life, into my life. Words from beyond that are so appropriate for where we live today. I love it. People say to me all the time, they say, you know, Daniel, people who I know who don't know the Lord, they say, you know, I know you love Jesus and obviously there's, you know, your life is unique and, and, and there's gotta be something there, but I don't know how you can trust an old book. And I like to tell them that Although cultures may change, people never change, and God never changes. Sure, like we live in the, we, we're 10 years into the iPhone. It's a little different from what Jesus dealt with. You know what I mean? Like, like I remember when I was in college to show my age, I remember they gave me something called an email. And I remember like here, you know, you can, you can, I was, a, I was a freshman in college. They gave me this email. And I'm like, well, why would I want to use that? And I think I sent two emails in four years of college. That dates me, doesn't it? You know, it shows I'm middle-aged, you know. It's like times change, but people don't change and God doesn't change. And so the most powerful truths about life and about humanity are truths that have always been known. This doesn't mean to be new. And I believe that God wants to speak into our lives. And not just so that we hear unique words, but that each one of us would simply respond to Jesus. Because whether you're here today and you're exploring Jesus, or whether you've been walking with Jesus for a half century, today is a day of invitation from God to say, I want to do something. 
I want, to be a, I want you to be a part of something. I want you to partner with me, God is saying, that we might usher into a divided world. Some of the most beautiful things. Are you guys game for that? Yeah. But don't miss the fact, we have to respond. Your responding to Jesus yesterday will not ensure that you're going to respond to him today. Today, you have to re-up today. And so we're going to be exploring this all summer together. I've been craving getting into the prophet Isaiah here at Crossroads for a while. Now, if you're with us on Wednesday nights, you realize it took me five years to make it from Genesis to Deuteronomy. <laughs> so the chances of getting to Isaiah on a Wednesday night sometime before I am uh, on AARP is probably pretty slim. <laughs> and so... I just figured for this summer, we're going to take some time. We're going to study the book of Isaiah together. So open up in your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, we're going to be taking verses 1 to 11 today. So grab a Bible, open it up. Of course, if you didn't bring a Bible with you here to church today, you can grab a, a Bible off the pews in front of you. All those books in the pews, the only Bible. There's no other catalogs or anything there, just Bibles. Of course, if you have a smart device, you open up that smart device, type in Isaiah 40 colon 1 to 11. Of course, for those of you who are online, don't forget to open up another browser window. And can we give a big shout out to our Southwest Portland campus? Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. You know, it's easy to find the book of Isaiah because it's the, um, the second largest book in your Bible. You have the book of Psalms, 150 chapters, and Isaiah, 66 chapters. It's actually, there's 66 books in the Bible, and a lot of people would say that the book of Isaiah is actually like a miniature Bible, where it's almost you have 39 chapters, which is resembling of the, what we call the Old Testament, and then chapters 40 to 66, 27 chapters, which is very similar to the New Testament, where it speaks about the work that God is to do. Isaiah preached into a divided kingdom about the mid-8th century to the beginning of the 7th century. So about 750, 740-ish, on down to about uh, 685, ballpark before the time of Jesus. So I want to just jump right on. Look what it says in chapter 40, verse 1. It says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord double for all her sins. My friends, this all begins with the fact that comfort is here right now. Comfort is is here. See, in the Hebrew language, there was no vowels. So if you wanted to emphasize something, it got repeated. Like if you want to emphasize something, if we're writing in English, we put an exclamation mark, right? Or if you're one of those people, you put everything in all capital letters, right? When you got something in all caps, it means this is important. In the Hebrew, they didn't have all caps and they didn't have exclamation points. So what did they use? They used repetition, right? And the idea of it, it was, it was characteristic of emotional and passionate speech. And so what we find here is this comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. You notice that word comfort happens three times in just over a verse. Now, why do we need comfort? Simply because we're discomforted, don't we? A word of comfort in a time of trial and challenge is necessary because we live in a world that is divided, that is challenging, that is disconcerting. But you have to ask yourself, not only have you received the comfort that God is offering to you, and if you have, are you someone who speaks comfort into challenges or are you somebody who exacerbates the challenges by not receiving from the Lord comfort and passing it along, but saying, oh yeah, it's really, really bad. Do you know how calming a word of comfort is in a time of struggle? We learn this as, as, as parents, Lynn and I, because you know, like, it's like parenting is like, a, I get why parents go gray. 
And it's not because you're, you know, I mean, my kids are a little wild, but, but, you know, like your kids are perfect. But, you know, it's like, but parenting is not easy. I'll never forget. So, you know, and especially when you have your first child. When Lynn and I, we got married, we had, we got pregnant right away. Well, Lynn did, you know, I was involved, but, you know, it's like, and, and <laughs> you know, and, and I remember, we, you, you, no one's really prepared for your first child. I mean, of course, you read a million books on it, and everybody tells you how they should parent, you should parent your kids, you know, but then when you're in the, in the middle of it, you don't know what's going on. And I remember, never forget, we had Obadiah, and he must have been about seven or eight months. And, 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 and he was playing on our bed with Lynn and I, and the bed was right next to a door that was kind of blocked shut, but the doorknob was still there. And sure enough, Obadiah was jumping, and sure enough, he hits his eye right on the doorknob. Yeah. And so the thing is, is that, that do- it was an old house. You know, like, you're like your bed was right next to a doorknob. Exactly. You know. <laughs> First apartment, you know, and, and so and so. Sure enough, his head hits this doorknob, and Linda and I are like, oh, "It's made the loudest noise." And then Obadiah looks at us, and we we're looking all freaked out. And then Obadiah starts wailing, wailing. And then, sure enough, I remember reading when it, when you're freaked out, don't show your kids because they'll freak out times ninety seven, you know, or something to that effect, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, I'm like, "Oh, it's okay, buddy." It's, it was just a loud noise. And Obadiah was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and like he just snapped right to it. And it and, and reminded me, and, and after it was over, Lynn's like, how'd you get so calm? I'm like, well, I was freaking out inside. I thought like he destroyed his eye socket bone, you know, like, oh, but I was going to be the kid with like one eye in and the other eye kind of out like a robot. It was real. I was really freaked out, you know, but I, but I remember that in the midst of this challenging situation, when someone speaks a calm word or a comforting word, how powerful that is. And that's a ministry, I believe. And I believe in perplexing times and divided times, are you the kind of person, because you have received comfort from the Lord, that you can speak comfort in times that don't make any sense? To say, I don't understand all this, but I know that God knows what he's doing. And God is worthy to be trusted. I believe that for some of you right now, the reason you're here is because you needed to hear that comfort is here now. Notice the words. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned for the Lord, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. It's saying, listen, God has already provided. And my friends, God has provided. How do I know? Because Jesus came and he died and he rose again. The comfort that a divided world needs has already arrived. We're not like the time before Jesus came where we're awaiting God's display of grace and mercy. We are living in an age of grace right now. And there is comfort. That comfort is here now for you in the trial that you're having, in the struggle that you're having, in the situation that you don't understand. God's comfort is here right now, and that comfort has a name, and it's Jesus Will you allow Jesus to comfort you in the midst of your discomfort? Will you allow Jesus to bring quietness to your soul in the midst of turbulent times? One of the most famous verses in the Bible, Psalm 23. Listen to Psalm 23, verse 4. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How can the psalmist say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Now, you got to think that in, that, in, in the time that that was written, this was long before, uh, you know, uh, county cared for street lamps. Right? When you went into a, a valley in the middle of the night... You were in complete darkness. If the moon was obscured by the trees, it was totally dark. And in that environment, even bringing a torch with light would be scary because you would draw attention to yourself for predatory animals or anybody who had malicious intent. So the idea of walking through the valley, I mean, we think, oh, I'll walk through a valley, and if I don't have a light, I just pull out my cell phone. I turn on the, 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 the flashlight. I'm all good to go. But the idea of walking through the valley is a time that I don't understand where I'm feeling hemmed in, where everything is dark. But he says, though I walk through the valley, even of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And Jesus promised to be with each one of us. 
Jesus is with you right now. Even if you don't believe in him, he is with you right now. Why? Because in him, you live and move and have your being. There's not a moment that you have had that has been apart from Jesus. Your life is in him, whether you realize it or not, but something powerful happens when you realize it. Because then Jesus begins to invite you, not into just you living your life, but he invites you into the abundant life, a life that is completely unique from what you would have guessed because God is saying, I have something that I want to do in your life. But comfort is here right now. Now, it's interesting. It, it, this line, it says, your warfare has ended. The war that a person is at with God is over because Jesus ended the war. Your iniquity is pardoned. The things that separate you from God, they've been forgiven through the finished work of Jesus, through his life that was given, his blood that was shed. And notice, it also says, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. That literally means that God has paid it in a sufficient way. That God has done more than enough for forgiveness. The cross reminds us that God's comfort is here. And then from there, notice what it says in verse 3. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, for every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. My friends, not only is comfort here, but the path is straight. The path is straight. Now, this is important because Isaiah speaking into a divided world is using very specific imagery. The imagery of, is of when a king or a leader would want to go into the area and before he went, people would scout out before them to make sure that this dignitary's passage would not only be safe, but would be smooth. That, that they would run the route first just to make sure. I, I'm not a runner. You guys know that unless I'm running for the cops. No, I'm just kidding. But that was the extent of the running I did growing up. was a running from the police, you know. And, and I was quick then, you know. I don't have to run from the cops anymore because I love Jesus. And Jesus loves me. Amen. <laughs> oh, those are some bad memories. <laughs> But I've been told by people who run for sport, not for survival, that, that, that if you're going to go run a course, you know, especially if you're doing cross country, not on like a track, but, but in those, those woodsy courses, that people would walk the course beforehand and see what's there. Where, where, where are the inclines and the declines? See, all that stuff, that's just preparation to be able to do something well. And so when a foreign king would come into an area, they would send people ahead of him to make sure that they understood the route and that they made sure that everything was smooth because the dignitaries didn't want to be inconvenienced. And so this picture here now is that there's a voice crying in the wilderness saying, the Lord is coming, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, this highway of God. Every valley that's low will be brought up. Every mountain will be brought down. So it's a straight place. And every crooked place shall be made straight. The path, my friends, is straight. Now what's beautiful is that every single gospel account applies this verse to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. Listen to John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. It says, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He said, no. And they said to him, who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, this is John the Baptist, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So these are, this, the idea of the past, John is saying, I'm the voice crying in the wilderness, saying the Lord is on the way, make a straight path for him. Now listen. John the Baptist was the forerunner, the one who prepared the way for Jesus in his first advent. 
Do you know who's the forerunner for Jesus' second coming? You and me, the people of God. Are you a voice crying in the wilderness saying, listen, the way is straight, the path is straight, the Lord is coming? See, the only way for us to be able to declare the straight path is that you and I be on the straight path. See, Jesus invites all of us. He says, enter by the narrow gate. The way is difficult. Few find it, but it leads to life. You know what the struggle we have in 21st century America is? is especially within the church, even here within our Crossroads family. For many of us, we want to do just enough to get into heaven and not do enough to catch ourselves in hell. We want to find where is the line? How far can I get? How close can I get so that I can experience things but still make it to heaven? And my friends, that isn't the heart of the Lord at all. Why would we want to see how close to the fire we can get before we get burned when there is an invitation from the Lord to walk in a unique way? And he doesn't just say, good luck. He says, I'm going to give you my spirit. And if you will trust in me, my spirit will empower you to live unlike you ever lived before. But are you one of those people? The path is straight, but you're saying, but how far over here can I get and still be on the straight path? Here's my thing. If you even have to ask the question, you already know the answer. That's what I've learned. If I have to ask God, does this honor you? I already know the answer. You don't have to try and get close to the line. See, it shows, in a sense, that you really don't want to follow Jesus because you want to know where's the boundary marker. When when you're following Jesus, it's almost like this. If you fall madly in love, right? If you fall madly in love, you're never like, well, how close is it to flirting with somebody else? When you're madly in love, all you think about is the object of your affection. Isn't it true? You don't think, well, how far is the line? No, you don't. You're so in love and so enraptured with the, with the object of your affection, you never even worry about this. There's no such thing as, how far over here can I get? My friends, the path is straight. And the world needs to see the people of God on the straight path. The smooth path. The path that says, I am living my life to prepare a way for the Lord to enter this world. Because you and I are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the vehicle for God to reach this world. See how simply responding to Jesus. If you're the kind of person right now where you're like, yeah, I'm trying to see how far I can get. Will you turn from that? That's what the Bible calls repentance. Will you turn from that and turn to the Lord and say, Lord, remove my desire for anything else that would obscure my life being a straight path. You got to think of a highway. A highway is not like a dirt road, a crooked road. A highway is actually designed for speed and for masses of people, right? It's like highways are three lanes and four lanes with no lights. Why? Because you're supposed to be able to just, just groove down that highway and get to your destination. And you want your life to be a highway that anybody who you know, people you work with, family members, all of a sudden they can just come on and they go, oh yeah, this is, an, this is a smooth path. That your life opens up the doors for people to come and know Christ. Are you willing to be a voice crying in the wilderness in a divided world? You know what the problem with the voice crying in the wilderness is? John the Baptist got his head taken off. You realize that, right? Like John lost his life. And we live in a day and age where if you decide to be a voice crying in the wilderness, people get upset with you. And not only just in the world, people in the church get upset with you too. You know how much trouble I've gotten in because I have the audacity to tell people that if you're really passionate about politics, you should love the person who is on the other side of the aisle. You know, it's funny. I had, in the course of one week here at Crossroads, I had two families leave the church. One said, because I'm a closet liberal, and the other said, because I'm a closet conservative. <laughs> I love that. Because I'm like, like, whatever your politics is, love your enemies. And they're not your enemies. They're your fellow countrymen. They just have a different set of beliefs on how this thing should work. But you should love them still. Why? Because that's what the gospel says. 
The gospel, like Jesus says this stuff, and he believes this stuff. He died for this stuff. But you have to be willing to, to be someone who speaks into a no man's land with what the truth is. This word of comfort. This word that there, God is on his way back in. And will you be a part of this? So we need to remember that the, the path is straight. I love this. Verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. Oh, see, this is what this is about. It's about God's glory, the weightiness of who God is, the reality of who God is. And notice, and all flesh shall see it together. Everyone's going to know. When Jesus returns, everyone knows it. And listen, the fact that Jesus came already, almost everybody knows it. The word has gone out. We need to make sure we get churches in areas that don't have a witness in their own heart language. You realize that there's thousands of people who live in areas where there's not a church that believes in Jesus who are doing ministry in their own heart language. Like here, if you want to go to a church, like if he's like, well, I'm tired of Fusco, there's like 900,000 churches, you know, of every stripe and size all over the county, you know, and there's more starting every day, you know. So it's like we got lots of church. There's people who don't have a church in a language they can understand. There are people who don't know the story of what God has done for them in Christ. We need to make sure we get that word out. Now look what it says in verse 6 here in Isaiah 40. It says, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? He says, all flesh is grass and all of its loveliness is like the flower of the field and the grass withers, verse 7, and the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. Brothers and sisters, I like to say this this way. We need God's wind on God's word. We need God's wind on God's word. Now, I'm going to explain this to you. The verses, really what they're saying is, is they're, they're reminding us that what unites humanity is our impermanence, our transient nature. That on this side of eternity, all of humanity is born, life continues on, at some point goes away. That unites all of us. Nobody here is going to be here eternally just the way that you are, no matter how cool, like, you know, the strange cage of Benjamin Button might be in a movie. You know what I mean? We all share a transitory nature as humanity. But not everything is impermanent. Because what we learn is that although all of us are like grass or the flower, flower blooms on up, blossoms looks amazing, and then withers away. We just had this at our house. You know, we, we went on vacation for a couple weeks, and, and one of our neighbors who was going to water our plants decided, you know, I mean, she's allowed to, end up going on vacation. So she, they watered it, and then right as it hit like 100 degrees, they were on vacation. So we came home, and... You know, and, and some of our plants, I mean, when we left, it was just so vivid. These, these little, you know, we bought, we bought them from the store, you know what I mean? And so they look great when we got them, you know. You just water them, you don't break them, you know. When we came home, it was all withered up in like six days. It's like, wow, right? All of our lives are like that, whether we like it or not. No matter how much money you spend on anti-aging cream, no, ma no matter how many nips and lifts and tucks you get, stuff bare, it, it, it goes out. It's the way it goes. It's all transitory, but not everything is because we learn that the word of God stands forever. See, this book, this book has been around for thousands of years. And guess what? If the Lord tarries, no matter how often people get at, we don't believe the Bible, we're going to banish the Bible. Listen, people are going to still believe the Bible because God's word stands. It's permanent. It's fixed. The word of God does not need cultural popularity from celebrities in America to have weightiness to it. It's going to stand. But notice how I said we need God's wind on God's word. Why? Because notice it, it's talking about humanity because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. That speaks of God's spirit. And what we need is we need to make sure that we have the spirit of God enlivening this book to our lives. 
Because you know what I see in, in, in the people of God, unfortunately, is that there's some people who love the Bible, but they are crusty, and they are dead, and they are angry, but they know the book. You know what I mean? Like, they know chapter and verse. They'll sit down, they'll tell you exactly what you're wrong about, but they don't love you at all. And that's what happens when you have God's word divorced from God's spirit. Because God, the fruit of God's spirit is what? Love. What else? Joy. What else? Peace. You guys know it. And if you don't know it, go to VBS. They'll teach you it there. <laughs> Galatians 5. There's 20 beautiful verses. See, but we need to make sure that as we study the word, we're saying, Holy Spirit, will you rest upon this book in my heart just as the Spirit hovered over the waters on the face of the deep at that creation account? We want God's Spirit to birth up in us fruitfulness in the word. Peter picks up on these very verses 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, it says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever because, and then Peter quotes these verses, all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And then Peter says, now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. You want to simply respond to Jesus today? God's wind, the spirit of God over God's word will make you love people fervently with a pure heart. Talk about a timeless truth in a divided world. That God's win, God's spirit will enliven a fervency in love from a pure heart. Not from a divided heart, not from an angry heart, but from a pure heart. And that's what God wants to do in each one of our lives. Now I have one more little section that I want to share with you. Look what it says in Isaiah 40 verse 9. It says, O Zion, you who bring good tidings... Get up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are young. Do you remember we already have seen that the path is straight and we're making preparations for the Lord to come? Now what we see here is that Zion and Jerusalem, Zion was Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the city. They have these, bring forth these glad tidings. Go up to the mountains. Don't be afraid. Why? Because you're God. Is here, And then it says, behold, your God shall come with a strong hand, right? His arm shall rule with him. His reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. You know what this teaches us? This teaches us that Jesus is the shepherd king. Jesus is the shepherd king. So it's a powerful picture what you have here. It's a powerful picture. Because what you have is... In Isaiah's day, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for this. But we know that his name is Jesus. And Jesus doesn't just come as a shepherd. He comes as a shepherd king. He comes with power and with nurture. He comes with strength and with paternal and maternal care for the people. Jesus is the greatest example of a paradoxical figure. The strongest with Total humility. So, I mean, when you think of people who are strong, right? Like I think of somebody who's a, who's a, a trained uh, 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 a fighter. You don't often think of somebody who's so sweet and kind and caring and nurturing, right? When you think of somebody who, who, who's spent their whole life learning how to, to fight, you don't think of them as the most kind-hearted person. 
But Jesus is both pure power and pure care. I mean, these verses are powerful. He comes with a strong hand. His arm shall rule. This speaks of Jesus as the great king, the king of kings and the, the Lord of lords. The, the, the king who subdues all kingdoms, where all the kingdoms of the world bow down before this one king. But he doesn't do it with brazen strength, machismo. His kingdom also involves him feeding his flock like a shepherd, gathering the lambs with his arm, carrying them in his bosom. I mean, you notice before I said that Jesus with paternal and maternal care, I threw that in there to see if I would make everyone nervous, but then when it says I'll carry them in my bosom, that's a maternal reference. It's the reference of a mother caring for her child, giving literally of herself for her child's care. Because Jesus isn't just a caring shepherd or a strong ruler. He is both together. It says this in John chapter 10, verses 14 to 16. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Brothers and sisters, because Jesus is the shepherd king and God has arrived, and we know his name is Jesus, he says, my sheep will hear my voice. Are you hearing his voice today? Are you responding to your Christian to the voice of our Lord? Has he been inviting you to seek reconciliation? Has he been inviting you to put feet on the faith that you hold and trust him and step out? Is he inviting you to, like our brothers and sisters who are in Lebanon right now, we're going to be going to Macedonia in a couple months, is he inviting you to step on out? Will you respond to him? Because the good shepherd sheep hear his voice and respond in life. If you're here today and you're following Jesus, will we recommit to simply responding to Jesus with our lives? To not being rebellious or stiff-necked or, or uh, temperamental with our Savior, but being willing to be the people that God has recreated us in Christ to be? Will you respond to him? But it also says that I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Sheep that will hear his voice, that there would be one flock and one shepherd. I believe that there are many of you here right now. You would never call yourself a Christian. You wouldn't say, I am a follower of Jesus, or as Jesus says, I'm a friend of Jesus. Every relationship begins with an invitation and a response. And Jesus is inviting you to be his friend. He's inviting you to be in relationship with him, to walk with him, to grow with him. And even right now as I share this with you, you would be considered the other sheep. You're, you're not part of the shepherd's Flock, but you're outside, and he's saying, but they're going to come too. And if you've never said yes to Jesus before, I believe that God has you here today, hearing this, whether you're in our sanctuary here in Vancouver or in our Southwest Portland sanctuary, if you're online or you're picking this up later, I believe that you are hearing this right now because Jesus is inviting you to receive his care. Jesus is inviting you to let your sins be forgiven, to, to, that he could speak comfort into your life, that in the midst of the divided world we live in and the divisions that are going on in your life, that he would do a work, a fresh work, 
that he would lead you through that narrow gate, on that difficult way, that the way is straight, few find it, but it does lead to life. And he wants to give you his wind, his spirit, his breath, to enliven God's word into your life, that your life may be a harvest. He wants to be your shepherd king. And I believe he's been stirring you. I believe you're hearing this because for long before this moment, you've been sensing an echo in your heart. A voice from beyond saying, come on. Every journey begins with one step, doesn't it? The first response. And if you've never said yes to Jesus before, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to begin that journey. And I will tell you, I can't explain to you all the details of every step it will take, but the journey begins with one step. And if you take that one step and respond to the invitation of God, Jesus will do things and involve you in things that you would never have ever dreamed you'd be involved in. But you'll be like, wow, what a Savior. So let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray together.